you're, 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 you're listening to the podcast for all of the news, notes, and breakdowns for your Ohio State Buckeyes. This is Sons of the Shoe with Nick Wilson and Spencer German. Nick Wilson and Spencer German are back. Sons of the Shoe is back. That's right, guys. And we've got... Well, Spencer got to react to the Cotton Bowl loss, 14-3. We have a little bit of reaction on that. Of course, we now have the national title game that is set. A little bit more Ohio State panic. Maybe maybe our Batman, right? Maybe our uh, White Knight coming to save the Ohio State football program. We will also fix the Bulls. But as we are a new podcast, please make sure to follow Sons of the Shoe wherever you get your podcast. That includes Apple, Spotify, the free Odyssey app, but hi, Spencer German. How you doing, bud? Uh, can't complain, Nick. Uh, just recovering from last night, staying up, watching the, the two college football semifinals. I actually thought uh, it was it was nice this year to have two games that were competitive because um, the story, obviously, about those games in the past has been that usually one is a blowout. So to see both games end up coming down to the wire, I think, was fun. Granted, obviously the first game we uh, we aren't too fond of, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think now we all you know I've always liked the color purple, both both the movie and just the color itself. It's it's a nice and color. What about so, the new movie musical they have coming out now? Have you not uh, seen that can't, yet? Can't speak to that. I haven't okay. seen it yet. It looks but, fantastic. I'm just yeah. Saying. No, I mean it, it's if if it's about you know the same it's the same storylines. I assume so. It's I'm sure it's probably pretty good. So I might have to check it out in the spirit of trying to support the color purple here leading up to next week's national championship game. So there you go. So it was, uh, it was a crazy night and I honestly kudos to Washington and Texas because Alabama, Michigan was kind of that throwback um, kind of, it was a high wire act of who's going to screw up the most and who's going to screw up latest, which is funny For- because I, I kept finding myself saying Bama, they had like a, they had like untimely penalties They'd have untimely turnovers. They would have just shooting yourself in the foot mistakes. And they also have a kicker, by the way. And I was like, is this – this is not the Nick Saban Alabama team that I'm used to. Usually they, they they are the most disciplined team in college football, and they don't have a kicker. Now they actually have a kicker, but they've given up. I, I guess they had to sacrifice to the football gods some of being like just all around good so that they could finally have a good kicker. They had to uh, sacrifice a well-rounded offense for just having a kicker. I like that. I mean, that really, I mean, if you think about it, what is miraculous is that Alabama had what a 20 to 13 lead with inside two minutes to go and they have a one dimensional offense. And I just, I think that's really fascinating. I do. It's funny because people have poked fun at Nick Saban's teams for not being well coached. I think if you've got a one dimensional offense, which in college football now in the playoffs, Offense seems to matter more than anything to have a seven point lead with two minutes to go. And Jalen Milrow, one, got hit a lot last night. Two, just the passing game was not there consistently. And even the ground game, like he made some plays, but this wasn't, you know, some of his more um, high profile games. And then for Michigan to kind of have to come from behind and kind of steal a win in overtime, I thought was really interesting. And in, listen, I think. I think you saw in the Washington-Texas game what can happen when you have two elite-level quarterbacks yeah. going. And I, and, and I think Quinn Ewers is a step below Michael Penix, but they're both ridiculous playmakers. I mean, Quinn has – both quarterbacks kind of have that ability to feel pressure and then kind of make uh, chicken salad out of chicken scratch. And I thought – I mean, Michael Penix just put on a show – Michael Penix might have jumped from like a third rounder to a first rounder last night because of what he did. And I, I was slightly facetious there, but uh, even Quinn Ewers, I mean, that thing, it looked like a blowout. And then out of nowhere, Texas storming back into it. And that game ended into the wee hours of the night, just absolutely killing everybody who had to wake up for their first day back to work <laughs> today. So thank you for that. But no, that was, that was the best round of first round of playoffs combined We've seen, and it does make me wonder whether, and maybe this is, you can skew it one way or another, whether we got the best football we're going to have, because now all of a sudden the stylistic differences between Washington and Michigan 
are, are going to be night and day, as opposed to Michigan and Alabama playing a similar style of ball and the same thing with uh, Texas and Washington? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, like last year we got um, – last year was similar in that we had games that were – solid in the semifinal rounds and then the final became an absolute just blowout of a game yeah um and you know you're hoping to avoid that i think this year uh but you're right like stylistically i i I guess on some level michigan is maybe used to seeing a team like washington in like what ohio state usually is because like last year i would probably say ohio state was very similar to what washington is this year they have a great quarterback uh, they got really good receivers. They're going to certainly be throwing the ball. There was a, they, they rattled off a stat early in that game last night um, about how Washington, prior to like week eight or something like that, their run-to-pass ratio was just like there was this massive discrepancy between it. It was like 70s or like 68 to uh, 32. And then it it they started to, over the last like four or five games – it went back to be more like 50-50. So they've clearly tried to prioritize trying to run the football a little bit more. Um, but you know what they want to do, and you have a great quarterback in Michael Penix Jr. who is going to allow you to do that. I think certainly Michigan's going to see the best quarterback they faced this year in Michael Penix Jr. I also thought it was funny, and we talked a little bit before we started recording here about it. Like, I I, I laugh at the – and this I guess maybe there's a little bit of homerism in this being uh, an Ohio state fan um, that I kind of get a kick out of the people who are trying to like stretch to make JJ McCarthy, some great NFL player. Um, But I laugh at the commentary on JJ McCarthy being an NFL prospect and all the things that people use to describe him are just like character traits. They're like, Oh, he's got a lot of heart and he's really tough out there. And when, when things get tight, he's not going to, you know, pucker up. He's going to really, power through and lead his team to victory. And then you go turn on the, the Texas, the Texas Washington game and Michael Penix has a defender in his face and just drops a dime of a pass down the sideline. And you're like, Holy crap, this guy playing a different sport. And the commentary on him is like, Oh yeah. Pinpoint accuracy and the stuff that you actually want to hear somebody talk about when they describe an NFL quarterback. So it's, it's just funny to see the discrepancy there. And I do think like the, the second matchup last night gave us like the two better quarterbacks, which made the game certainly maybe not, maybe not the two games were both fun in their own way, but that one was certainly more fun in terms of like the modern version of football. So it'll be interesting to see how that style contrasts with Michigan. I do think that uh, Washington's defense might have some trouble stopping Blake Corum, which is probably, I'm guessing Michigan's game plan is going to center around like, we're going to run the football, which is their kind of their identity anyway. And can Washington stop us? And even if they can't, I think on the flip side, I think Michigan's defense, they've been able to take care of a lot of quarterbacks that aren't as mobile or that only can do so much. Penix feels like he's the full package. So I'm I'm curious to see how they defend him and if they're able to slow down that offense that's been so good. I, I think equally these two teams might be able to put up some points and then it might just be who kind of gets the, the momentum going in their favor, who doesn't make the big mistake or turnover. Um, but, yeah, it's, it sets the stage for a big game, even though I'm certainly hopeful that one team wins over the other for sure. It's it's not gonna There's not going to be a lot of – a lot of times I go to these national championship games when Ohio State is not involved and I can just be like, all right, I'm just going to enjoy the game. This one I'm, I'm not going to be enjoying as much because I definitely want I'm, – I'm leaning one side over the other. I just think it's interesting after watching last night, and I I don't mean this in a way to disparage any of the four teams, because I think Washington has been maybe one of the most slept on dominant teams in college football history. We've talked about that a lot. And it's almost disrespectful at some point. Like Michael Penix absolutely is elite. Um, Michael Penix should have clearly been the Heisman, in my opinion. And like, then you start to go to some of the other talent. Braylon Trice is a dude. Uh, they're yeah. wide receivers. They got some. They just have some phenomenal wide receivers as well. So they they got guys, and I just think they're disrespected. Now that being said, and I I don't. It's funny because now you have to compare it to what you saw in the Cotton Bowl, and one, I think your uh, your team would have looked a little different if uh, you were playing in the playoffs. So I think that's important to kind of offset any concerns about scoring three points against Missouri in the uh, the Cotton Bowl. But if you just had a better quarterback, and meaning like all season long, if you had had a better quarterback and you had made the playoffs, 
I'll be honest with you. There's nothing that tells me that Ohio State couldn't have hung with the teams we saw yesterday outside of the quarterback position. Like it only highlighted watching that game last night only highlighted, like you mentioned JJ McCarthy, he's acceptable, but acceptable was better than Kyle McCord and a damn sure was better than Devin Brown in the cotton bowl. So you go to um, Jalen Milrow. The guy's got one elite skill, which is scrambling around the field right now. That's, that's the, but that offense is one dimensional. And so that's the difference is you had a quarterback with no, nothing elite who was just kind of okay. He was just kind of there. And then as we saw in the Cotton Bowl, like you you had a quarterback who was less than what Kyle McCord was. And it's just crazy to watch last night and remember, like the only thing that separated you from beating Michigan and from potentially winning a a national championship, or at the very least just being in the playoffs again and being in a closely uh, competed game, the only difference was the quarterback position. I think that's a fair point, um, and, and I, do, I think maybe you could throw offensive line in there, and I'm sure we'll get into that conversation as well. As I, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear some of your overall thoughts on on what happened on Friday night because I had a chance to talk about it for an hour um, with many of our viewers and, and commentators on YouTube. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So we'll, I know we'll get to that here coming up, but um, yeah, I, I, th- I think that certainly was was glaring in, in in watching those games last night. Was the quarterback play was was the biggest thing holding Ohio State back. Um, I, well, I and real I, quick on that, it's a damn shame that Marvin Harrison Jr., who as as great as he was this year, he was held back by the quarterback play. It's a damn shame America didn't get to see this version of Marvin with the appropriate level of quarterback. Yeah, because well, it, uh, it would have yeah. been really fun. He would have been the talk of town, just like Michael Penix is right now. Win or lose, it would have been Marvin Harrison Jr. and Michael Penix would have been two of the biggest things come out of these playoffs. Well, and and I guess Amer- America did get to see that, I guess, a little bit last year. Um, they got at least a taste of that with C.J. Stroud and Marvin Harrison Jr. Because let's face it, I mean, Marvin Harrison Jr. was putting on a show in that game. Georgia had no answer for him. And if he doesn't get knocked out because of the hit to the head – you almost wonder if Ohio State does win that game, and then you get a second game of of Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, in the national championship with a chance to do it again. So, um, yeah, I, I I think that was what was the most glaring about those games last night because we obviously are watching these things from an Ohio State angle for sure. But um, I I'm I, one other note on Washington being slept on. They're going into this cha- this championship game now as I think a five and a half point underdog every step of the way they keep being listed as an underdog. They were a double-digit underdog against Oregon, who they had already beaten once this year. And then they – and I think that matters because you talk about, like, being battle-tested. Listen, credit to Michigan. They got their first – Ohio State was probably their first, like, real test. They rose to the occasion, got the late turnover. You wonder how that drive ends if if, if things go a little bit differently. But they they got the win. They go on. Um, They win the Big Ten. Now they go to the playoff. They get tested again in, on the big stage against Bama, and they were trailing late in that game. They pulled off a great comeback. Credit to them for pulling off the, the drive to tie things up and then winning it in overtime. Um, but now you talk about teams that have been, like, tested. The, the, the two teams left, Washington has been way more tested coming out of a Pac-12 that, like you said, you've been saying it all year, and, we've, and I've agreed, at, was maybe the best conference in football this year. You had to play – the likes of Caleb Williams, you had to play Oregon twice, and you beat them twice. Don't you, sleep on that Utah team. That Utah yeah, team yeah. would have been probably the third best team in the Big Ten this year. You had to play Utah, who's always a, a that's always a, a like like a battle. You had to you, you, you know Washington State, your biggest rival, took it to the brink. Like they have been tested, and they have withstood. Now they beat Texas. Like they have beaten everybody in front of them, and they continue to just prove everybody wrong that wants to make them underdogs. So I think that does matter in the context of that conversation as well. And um, I'm curious to see, obviously, how that one plays out. But, yes, from an Ohio State angle, I think we did see that, um, that yeah, the, the quarterback play was the biggest thing separating them from being on the same level as these teams. And if they had that, they would have been right there with these teams. Real quick, too, Nick, does the semifinal games being as competitive as they were validate the committee made the right choice. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess in a way, I mean, I, I think the reality is, um, I, I think some people wanted to deny what happened to Florida state 
was some sort of uh, where Georgia just kicked the living crap out of him, that that was some sort of uh, a, a moment that proved that the, the college yeah, football it, selection committee did it right. It was a completely different team. But I, I will say, though, like I don't – outside of Jordan Travis playing against Georgia – I don't know what Florida State was going to put out there on the field with Keon Coleman, and I love Keon Coleman. With like, go to go to some of the big names that actually didn't play in the game, and like, I get it. But the reality is, you got curb stomped by a better team. And I think if you put that with the actual playoffs, I'll be honest with you. If you're looking, I think that I don't think this is the year that the college football selection committee needs to be validated. Because one, next year is the the twelve year or the twelve team playoff, and two, I just think, quite frankly, like I think they made the right decision, and I think people who uh, are against it either are ACC honks, Florida State honks, or just don't like the system. And I think there's a lot of that in college football. I think there's a lot of it doesn't really matter. Like whatever system is, the system is fucked. Right. If it's if it's uh, if we're going to determine a national champion off uh, of off a poll, well, it's not fair. It's not right. Okay. Now we have a national title game. Well, how do we decide that? Okay. Well, that's not right. All right. But BCS, that's not right. And it's just, I think, I think there's this this delusion in the idea of some college football fans that there's this perfect goal you can get to, and in reality, there isn't. Like you're dealing with an imperfect way. You're trying to to crown a champion across 128, 134. I can't remember how many Division One schools there are right now. Like it's not going to be pretty. So, like whatever, whatever. There's going to be a downside to everything that you do, and it's just a little asinine that people continue to gripe about this. When I'll be honest with you, I, I it has not always been pretty. They've not always gotten it right. And the selection committee has not always been a pure heart or pure mind. They have had biases, but like, I don't know how you watch last night and don't think to yourself, Oh, thank God. Cause I'll tell you right now with, with Trent Rodemaker or Timmy Rodemacher or uh, Trent Rosencrantz or whatever, uh, Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, whoever the hell would have been the Florida state starting quarterback. Uh, any one of those matchups and Florida state is beat and housed by three, four, maybe five scores. And I, I I, don't know how you watch the Florida State-Georgia game and, more importantly, watch last night and understand that so much of the magic of Florida State was Jordan Travis. And what I would say to Seminoles fans, because I think it's I, – I do understand the hurt and the frustration. You had a special season that was cut short because of injury, and nobody likes to do that. And we like to throw around words like fair. Oh, it's not fair. It's college football. It is a business, all right? Life isn't fair. There's a lot of things that happen in the world of any sort of business, whether you're in radio, whether you're in TV, whether you're in marketing, whether you're a finance bro, that aren't fair. And this idea that the world has to be fair and there's these white knights that can save it is kind of embarrassing. And the idea that the only place that we hold to a standard of fairness is college athletics because of some misguided outdated representation of amateurism, here's the best thing I can say to Knowles fans. Because again, none of what I just said matters to you. It's your team. It was a special year. And it's okay to feel like you got screwed. But here's what I can tell Knowles fans. If If the same thing happened to Washington, if Michael Penix Jr. with three games to go blew out his name, Washington would not have been in the playoffs yesterday. They just wouldn't have. They would not have. They would not have been facing Texas right now. They're it not. Probably, it way. probably would have been Michigan. It probably would have been Bama. It would have been Georgia. It would have been Texas. Those would have been the four teams that were in. So the reason why I point that out is like that is another team where the quarterback is so special. The way Jordan Travis is special to the Knowles and their chances to compete. He's so special. You take him off that team. They're a good team. They're not a great team. So it just happened to be Florida State that caught it this year. But, like, to do this whole – and I'm not saying Florida State fans are doing this, although right. some Florida politicians – Well, I think they are. But, I, but, it's but because they, they're, they've lost their minds. They're, like, going after Kirk Herbstreet saying it's his fault. Uh, they're blaming ESPN. Like, the, the conspiracy theory rabbit holes are, are rampant, which, by the way, the ACC has a deal with ESPN. Like, it, it, does, it doesn't behoove them to not have an ACC team in. But it's also funny because the irony of the ACC being the one conference that voted against going to 12 teams this year 
And then there the converse that got left out is kind of funny when you look back on it. Like, how can you not look back on that and laugh? Like you you basically wrote your own, you you dug your own grave. You you said you did this to yourself. You could have had 12 teams this year. And you talk about fairness, Nick. Like, I think, yes, nothing to this point's been fair and nothing's going to be totally fair at all times in sports and that's just kind of how it goes i mean for i mean shit the 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 lions just lost a game to the cowboys on saturday night because the officials blew the understanding who was going to be eligible who wasn't going to be eligible on the offensive line like that's what happens in sports sometimes and it isn't always fair but i do think like if you want fairness you're getting the best system for that next year and that they're going to say hey we're putting 12 teams in and even some teams that maybe don't fully deserve it are going to at least have a shot. And then you get a chance to see if you can do anything with it. And so that is going to be the fairest system. And you guys flat out said no to that this year. You said, no, we're good. Let's stick with four. Okay. Well, now you got left out and now you're going to learn that maybe you should have done it this way in the first place. But yes, to your point, if the injury had happened to Michael Penix Jr., I think the same thing applies I think the same thing applies if that happened to uh, any of these four teams. Like if you lose a starting key player, particularly at that position, I think the committee would have had a conversation about it and thought about what was going to make sense or if it were there, they were putting the right teams in. So it's just kind of par for the course. And uh, I, I, I think on some level, could you make an argument that maybe Georgia should have got in over Bama or something like that? Maybe. Um, but I, I think ultimately like when you get good games, and at least on some level validates that the committee got something right in putting matchups out there. Because I, my biggest argument always is, Nick, I understand there's a lot of blowouts in college football. I get that that happens. But when you get two evenly matched teams against each other, I think college football ends up being more entertaining a lot of times than even the NFL. Because, And I think we saw that on full display last night. Two different styles of teams versus each other. And those games were super, super entertaining from start to finish. All right, guys, we got more to get into. Uh, I will take a, another stab at uh, addressing what happened with the Cotton Bowl with Ohio State with Ryan Day, state of the program type stuff. And could social media be showing us that there is a white knight riding majestically off in the distance that could be headed to save Ohio State? Nay, Columbus! But first, a word from our sponsors. So now it is time to address that 14 to three embarrassing performance by the Buckeyes in the Cotton Bowl. And I would like to say, I thought every reaction the night of was pretty fitting. Um, your backup quarterback, uh, who had been in, I mean, up until like what week two or week three, a serious part of a quarterback competition, uh, went out there against a Missouri team that, by the way, Missouri's a nice team. And Eli Drinkowitz has done a good job. To, to the surprise of me and many who followed him at App State and thought him a careerist little B. While he has proven to be a good football coach in Missouri, that's a tough place to win, and he did that. Now, I digress. I thought all the reactions on the day of were appropriate. I think as we have moved on from it, which were, by the way, which were frustrations at the quarterback spot, which were frustrations at the offensive line and how they played. The defense played well enough to win. Um, I thought other guys on the offense played well enough to win. Um, and I thought, honestly, I felt bad for Travion Henderson, who looked like one dude trying to do a million things out there. But as I reel it in here, the thing that I think, what I think is interesting is every time something bad or even perceptionally bad happens at Ohio State, I think there's this, this thought of, oh, this is now the worst. And it brings out the John Cooper tropes. And it brings out the sky is falling. And the reality is, I don't know how anyone can come off the last six weeks of Ohio State football and feel remarkably sunshiny and, oh, everything's great and nothing's the matter. And I think if Ryan Day still thinks that he can get by with small changes to, to better himself for next year, right? If, if, if he is not convinced over the last from Michigan to Missouri, that maybe more than a tweak or two needs to happen. And when I say tweak or two, I mean like one coach being fired. If he still thinks that, then he is probably doomed. 
But I, I, the doomsdayers that are are certain that Ryan Day should be fired today because of the Cotton Bowl, like let's let's all be honest here. Unless you were in the Final Four of the playoffs, nobody's going to play the same way they did when it was Ohio State, Michigan, and you're not going to have the same team, the same fire. It's just there's such a long gap between the bowl season and you know the conference title games. Like so much happens. Now, when you come out and you have the starting center, who, by the way, didn't play a single snap in the Cotton Bowl, come out and say, oh, yeah, there were we really didn't practice at all leading into that game. When you, when you start to realize that Ryan Day was out hitting the road trying to recruit to save this class and that they and, – and there were multiple staff assistants, this is a report, that multiple uh, assistants didn't show up for key meetings during your prep time for the Cotton Bowl – those are all real concerns. And the simplest way for Ryan Day to right the ship is to kind of go full-on dictator here, is to basically do what you and I know Urban Meyer would do, which is fire some dudes, stomp around, put his D on the table, and do what you're going to do. I don't know if he'll do that, but that's the simple fix right now to reclaim his power in Columbus because it's apparent that things... I'll tell you this. Well, who is the who is the offensive lineman that spoke on a podcast? Uh, Hinsman. Yeah, it was the center uh, Carson yeah. Hinsman. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now. That's that ain't happening with Papa Herbs. That ain't happening with Jim Tressel. Yeah. So I think I think those things are things we can look at and go, man, you failed a basic test here. But to say that Ryan Day needs to be fired today because of the Cotton Bowl, no. Am I more concerned today after seeing the fight that team put up? Yes. Am I more concerned with every bit of reporting? And do I think that Ryan Day's balls are this close to the bandsaw? 100%. <laughs> but I think the farther we get away from the Cotton Bowl, I think you have to understand, I think the more important thing that happened in the month of December for Ohio State was that he held together a strong recruiting class, including – the likes of Jeremiah Smith, including the likes of Air Nolan. And if you fired him today, that class would be severely compromised. So unfortunately, this is the captain of the boat that you got up until probably next December. But the reality is it's now on Ryan Day to right the ship, to get things pointed in the right direction, because whether it's the Cotton Bowl or not, you got worked. And you got worked because Ryan Day is an offensive head coach, offensive side of the ball, offensive coordinator, play caller, and you scored three points in the effing yeah. Cotton Bowl. Well, There's no way to look at that as anything other than WTF, what the hell are you doing? I think that's – you hit the nail on the head in terms of, like, it's not about the Cotton Bowl. It's, it's not about the fact that, like, oh, the, it's the fact that they looked lifeless in the Cotton Bowl. It's the fact that – Ryan Day is supposed to be some offensive guru, quarterback, whisperer, whatever you want to call it, who always has the right guy under center. And clearly we saw this year, maybe he put his, his money on the, or put, put all his stock in the wrong person. Um, like these are his players. These are his recruits. You know, Devin Brown is one of his recruits. Lincoln Keenholz is one of his recruits for him to have no game plan on the possibility that Keenholz could have to step in at any point for Devin Brown, who, by the way, had already been hurt a couple times this year, it, it made no sense to me. So, I like I said, Friday night was rock bottom for Ryan Day. I don't think there's any way to other 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 way to put that. Like you lose to Michigan a third straight year, and you know, and I said it that I said it on Friday night, Nick. Like two years ago, you lose to Michigan, you go to the Rose Bowl, which is still a big deal, and. Yes, the season didn't go the way you wanted, but you come out with a win over Utah in like a shootout, and you start you saw sort of the the next phase of what Ohio State was going to look like. It was Marvin Harrison Jr.'s coming out party. It was Emeka Ibuka was putting up numbers. It was C.J. Stroud getting more experience, and you walked away from that game like, oh man, like this this team's going to be really really good. Then last year, you you lose to Michigan, but you still got into the playoff. And you put up a great fight where it was like, man, they were a couple plays away from going and potentially winning a national championship. So you felt you had, you had something you could feel good about. This year, 
you got nothing that you can feel good about. You, you, you had nothing to show in that game, even though I understand it was Devin Brown and it was a different looking team. I guess the one thing is that you, you feel good about the idea that a lot of these defensive guys might come back and you feel like your defense could be really good next year. But that just makes me worried if they don't get you know, a quarterback. You know, that... the only thing I would say, though, is I disagree that nothing good happened this year. The Notre Dame games and the Penn State games were good wins. Like, I, I, I understand that that in reality, we're talking Michigan is the only game that matters on that schedule and that winning against Missouri would have at least stopped the bleeding in the eyes of some Ohio State fans. Yeah, But, like, Marvin Harrison was a Heisman finalist. I think you saw uh, Carnell Tate and G. Scott take a step. I think you did find one or two offensive linemen moving forward. You just need about three more. I don't. So, th- it's it's not it's not so much that I don't think anything good happened at this season as much as it's like you had something to feel good about going into the next year at the end of these previous seasons, even though you lost to Michigan. Whereas this year. The only thing you're hanging your hat on is a recruiting class that you might not even see a lot of these guys playing for two two years from now. So I it, like right now you don't have the quarterback in the transfer portal coming. We don't that that might change. We're going to get into that. I know. Um, you don't. Your offensive line looks like it's still a mess. Like there's still so much to do, and it's also with the backdrop that Michigan's going to go play for a national championship, and that changes things too. Because at least the two previous years when Michigan made the playoff. You got to kind of laugh at their expense, even though they beat you. It was like, oh, ha, ha, ha. You guys still are no match for those SEC teams. You lost to Georgia. And then, and then last year, and then last year, um, (laughs) and then last year was TCU and you got outlasted by them. And then they went and got boat raced by Georgia. And it was like, oh, Michigan didn't belong again. But then this year they go like the preview here. Here's the way I'll put it to you. Like, Yes, Michigan beat you the previous two seasons, and that was tough enough to deal with. But then them not going on and winning a national championship or even being in that game at least kind of made it seem like, okay, Michigan's better than you during the regular season and all this, but it's not like they're world's better national championship contender. Now they like that, that's supposed to be Ohio State. If they go and win the national championship next week, they truly have taken everything that you were supposed to be and they and they stole it from you like they flat out stole your lunch and that does that, that, that in no way shape or form can that sit well and that's why Wait, i think to your point doesn't, to your, it, doesn't it make the ohio state loss to michigan actually look more defensible like if they go and win the national title and again you and i both agree none of these teams are the dominant level we expect them to be normally there's no monolithic Georgia. There's no monolithic Alabama. There's no monolithic Ohio State. But isn't it a better look if Michigan goes and wins a national title considering how close that game was and it really came down to two awful plays by Kyle McCord? To an extent, yes. But I I, I don't know that Ohio State fans are going to ever look at it that way because they be- – like, like, listen, let's face it. We believe that this program in Ohio State – is supposed to be constantly always in the national championship picture. That was that was the trajectory of this program for so many years under Urban Meyer, even Jim Trussell before him. Like you were there and Michigan had sort of faded into the darkness. Now all of a sudden, and you knew it wasn't going to last forever that Michigan was going to not beat you. It's one thing for them to beat you. It's another thing for them now to have the image that you're supposed to have of being that national title contender. And that's where they're at. Like they, they, they will have at this point taken everything from you and you're left kind of holding the bag here, which is why to your point on, on Ryan day, I do think if this isn't the wake up call, if sitting at home and watching Michigan go to the national championship after you gave you, after you put up three points in a pathetic effort in the, in the, in the, against Missouri, if that isn't enough to get you to, to motivated to, do you know go di- full dictator and take this thing over and d- direct it the way it needs to be then i don't know what's going to be the wake-up call for him and it really is like 2024 will really be just him following his marching orders to a slow slow uh end to his time in ohio state like that that's what it, the, the path he's on if he doesn't do exactly what you sort of laid out so this is again where you and i just diverge a little bit because I think I think he's smart enough to know the Big Ten is going to look a little different next year. Not just with the addition of more schools, but more importantly, Michigan's probably not going to be Michigan next year. Who knows if Harbaugh is going to be there? 
Um, it actually might be better if J.J. McCarthy's starting than if we go full orgy because Alex Orgy looks like a full-blown unit. Um, so that is where, like, I, I still think we're we're talking about let's make some changes here. But I think some of that change is Ryan Day needs to be more open to Ohio State fans. And this is something we've talked about a lot with Stefanski. Um, when you are winning, you can get away with anything right? You can say nothing. You can uh, talk about every cliche in the book, right? You can flat out lie to the media and to the fans about injuries. But when you're losing, and in this case, it's it's insane to think about because they lost two games. But yes, Ohio State lost the most important game of the year, the third straight year that that Ryan Day has done that, and they haven't won a national championship uh, since Urban Meyer was the head coach. So that is, that is for Ohio State, that is losing. And so, you know, last year, Ryan Day did the, oh, man, if it's in the best interest of the team stuff about, you know, losing play calling. And then turns out he didn't give up play calling. And every other change, whether it was a quarterback battle or every other change that they could have made last year, he hemmed and hawed or did the, oh, shucks thing. Well, you can't do that now. So I think it would be really smart of Ryan Day. And this is where I do think coaches can just be better. Like, you know, I think it's so much easier for Ryan Day to do this than to NFL teams to do this. You exist in a fiefdom. People just want to feel safe and and secure and happy with Buckeye football that it's on the men. So if tomorrow Ryan Day held a press conference and said, one, these two coaches are fired, and I would start with a special teams coach, and I would start with the offensive line coach, because that guy has not done dick since he has been here. And I, I, I can tolerate a lot. I can I can tolerate. Ah, we 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 misguessed. All right, we we underestimated the quarterback. I can tolerate that because you've got a track record of good quarterbacks. I cannot watch another bad, piss-poor offensive uh, offensive line performance from Ohio State. And it took Jim Knowles how many years to fix the D-line? And it still isn't perfect, but at least you got it where it needs to be, to where that defense could only give up 14 points to a pretty damn good Missouri offense. I can I can put up with a, with a short-term setback for a long-term, whatever the hell that line is. But So I think you start there. And the third thing is, Come up with a Michigan package. Every day, here's what we're doing to beat Michigan. And that's easy. And by the way, you should do it. I just think, like, it's so so infuriating because Ryan Day is so close. But I think he needs to do a better job. It's a fiefdom in Columbus. People just want to be happy. People, And if you said to people tomorrow, even if let's put the coaching changes to the side. If you just said... You know, I talked with Urban, I talked with Tress, I talked with other great Ohio State figures, and I realized two things. One, I maybe misunderestimate, misunderestimated, underestimated the Ohio State-Michigan rivalry. I've not put enough emphasis on it. And two, here's what we're doing to fix that going forward. And it would calm the nerves of every Buckeye fan instead of mopey and Ryan Day. Like, Get out there, like throw up the throw up the defenses. It's really not that hard to win over college football fans when you can point to two losses this year, even though they were the last two games. When you can point to the number two recruiting class in college football, when you can point to a track record that at face value looks good. I think you I think you announce coaching staff changes tomorrow and you announce a Michigan package and what it looks like. And I think Ohio State fans would be orgasmic. I do think the uh I do think the Parker Fleming stuff is um is is interesting because I, I, I would read more up on that that he's the special teams coordinator for Ohio State. Ohio State's one of the only teams in the country that even has like a true special teams coordinator. There's it's just that's just not really a thing. In college football, so I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and, and then Justin, his units are still bad. Yeah, well, and, and, one job, and 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 Mirko entering the portal. I don't know how much that had to do with anything, but I mean, so pissed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he probably was the MVP of the Cotton Bowl, so maybe he thought he could get some more nil money. I don't know. Um, Going full McCord, you never go full Honda McCord. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I mean, like Justin Fry, like there's some questions there about just the recruiting along the offensive line. That unit needs to be better. Well, and I guess to sum up everything you're saying and being more transparent and finding 
small victories now as the offseason begins for Ohio State. What does that mean for the Buckeyes if they were to land one Will Howard, who they have been linked to over the last couple weeks now? There's rumors that he's kind of quietly committed to Ohio State. You and I are on Instagram following, watch, and seeing who he's following on Instagram. His latest follow, by the way, is Jeremiah Smith, among among a number of other Buckeyes. So um, what does he do in terms of moving the needle, you think, for Ohio State fans? Um, and uh, what's interesting about Will Howard, too, is – Actually, real quick. Yeah, go let's ahead. Let's put a pin in it. And I, we will both share our thoughts on Will Howard, who sounds like a Ivy League quarterback. But first, <laughs> a word from our sponsors. Mentioned it in the last segment there at the end. We do have IG Watch going on right now. That's right. I'm looking here. Will Howard's latest follows the former Kansas State quarterback, Jeremiah Smith, Travion Henderson, Ryan Rudzinski, who I now understand exists, Jalen McLean, <laughs> and Luke Montgomery, all Buckeyes in the recent follow history here of Will Howard. And that has Ohio State fans. You know, by the way, that Buckeye Panic – has reached a fevered pitch when Will Howard, who is not a guy, it was Cam Ward, it was Dante Moore. Which, right? by the it way, I I I think I might have forgot to share it with you. I, I um I couldn't read the full story, but I got like because I'm not a I'm not a twenty four seven sports premier subscriber. Yes. Um, but uh, I kind of saw the summary of it on on social media. Cam Ward apparently called Jeremiah Smith the day of his commitment and said, if you go to Miami, I'll go to Miami. And there were the whole story was about how Jeremiah Smith was still like wavering going into his decision, but he ended up sticking with the Buckeyes. And I was fascinated by the idea of Cam Ward being like, dude, if you come here, I'll go here. And then Jeremiah Smith stuck by good old Brian Hartline and decided to still come to Columbus. It's pretty crazy. And then, and then Cam Ward announced his intention to enter the NFL draft. Yeah. Yeah. So that you're talking about the uh, the domino effect there, but I, I think what's interesting with Will Howard is I think a lot of people look at his his stats, and you know his stats aren't he, what maybe he had worse passing numbers than Kyle McCord, and that's why people yeah. are like, is this guy really that good? And and my response would be, I it's really tough. One, I don't know the guy has any exceptional tools, which should scare you because that's why Kyle McCord failed this year. He was just kind of good or acceptable at a lot of different spots. Um, I do think Will Howard is more mobile, which I think ironically after, after Ryan day, not running CJ Stroud at all. I think, I think Ryan day learned if you're not going to fix the offensive line, you better have a guy that can move around a little bit, but I would just, the danger of saying Will Howard is worse than Kyle McCord. Will Howard has never played with the kind Mm -hmm. of weapons that he will play in Columbus. And I mean, I think Chris Kleiman's a hell of a head coach. He's not an offensive guru that has put, you know, three straight quarterbacks into, uh, well, okay, Ryan just put one into uh, Syracuse, but the other three quarterbacks that Ryan has had, he put into the first round of the NFL. Yeah, I, th- I think that's well said on just the the players that Will Howard's played around versus what Kyle McCord had this year. And I, I think if you're sitting here just saying, well, Will Howard's got worse numbers than – then Kyle McCord, what's the difference? Um, I think it's a prisoner of the moment sort of take because yeah, you're right. Like at face value, they're not they're not as good passing wise. But to your point, you're not thinking of that context. And I I think like what are we are we going to see similar numbers from Kyle McCord that he had at Ohio State this year when he goes and plays at Syracuse next year? Like that that's why I say it's prisoner of the moment because we could be sitting here next year saying like. Man, Kyle McCord really uh, screwed the pooch on deciding to go to Syracuse of all teams and play, and maybe he should have stayed at Ohio State where he had all these weapons around him and maybe could have still been the starter. I don't know. Like, I I don't know. I I think that conversation is still kind of yet to be determined in terms of who's the better quarterback of the two. Um, But, I mean, I'm excited by the idea of Will Howard. I don't know if he doesn't move the needle for me the way that a Cam Ward would have. He doesn't necessarily move the needle the way – you know, some of these other guys that were out there um, may have, 
but and I also do think I I reserve I'm reserving some judgment on even what quarterback they're going with next year until I see them also kind of address the offensive line. Um, I, I think they're going to have to sort of bolster some things there in the transfer portal as well. But the idea of a quarterback who can be more mobile, who can do the things that Cam or sorry that Will Howard can do. I think does make me excited. And I think like at the, I, I, I think at the very worst, you're getting a quarterback that's more mobile than Kyle McCord at the best. I think you're getting a quarterback that can do all the things he can do and maybe better in the passing game. Plus you get the bonus of, okay, he's going to be able to run the run around a little bit and create some things with his feet when the, the pocket collapses on him. So I, I think, and it's also the nice, the other positive of it all and this is something we've talked about a lot, is if you don't want to disrupt your recruiting class, a.k.a. Aaron Nolan, who's coming in this year, and his progression towards starting potentially in 2025, you want somebody who's going to be a one-and-done type guy or a one-and-pro type guy, and that's what Will Howard basically would become for you. He would be a guy who starts this season, probably isn't back next year, probably is going pro the, that, that next year, and then it paves the way for somebody like Aaron Nolan to start immediately. Well, and I just think, like, I do think, I think in the psyche of Buckeye fans and maybe Ryan Day, I think there might be value in him just not being Devin Brown, and I do, like or or not being Kyle McCord. And I think you know I think you see this a lot in the NFL. Teams are always looking for a quarterback to sell fans to, and yeah. a lot of the times it's a bad idea. Like Atlanta really thought they were going into this year with Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter, and this. This is going to be the thing. And the problem is you think about the first part of the sale. You don't actually think of the cost of the transaction. The cost of the transaction was Atlanta in a in a division in the NFC South that they could have run away with if they had even Russell Wilson from Denver who just got benched. Uh, you could be like a 10 or 11 win team. But they were so consumed with, well, we just got to sell the fans on anything that they didn't really think it out. I actually think this is one of those cases where – I think you can sell Will Howard as, hey, he's kind of a blend of these two guys in Devin Brown and Kyle McCord in a good way, right? He's got mobility, but he also has more of the the, the arm that maybe you were hoping for that Devin Brown didn't showcase that clearly might not have against, um, against Missouri in the Cotton Bowl. And more importantly, then it just allows you to have a face of your quarterback competition. So if Devin Brown makes leaps and 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 jumps this next offseason, well, don't don't jump too hard. You might uh, hurt your ankle or something. I mean, my goodness, injury pot shot, not great, Bob. <laughs> um, or if Lincoln Keen holds, or guys, if Air Nolan just comes in and is you know the prophet, he just comes in and he just steps and he's just ready. I don't expect that, but that could happen. Well, then all of a sudden you have somebody that somebody with a real reputation that any one of those three guys has toppled, right? Worst case scenario, in theory, is Will Howard just takes the job. And I don't think that's a worst case scenario. The guy scored 30-plus touchdowns last year. Yeah. He he does have experience. He only is going to be here for one year if he does come at all. Like, I just think it makes sense on a lot of different levels. And I think I think I don't think if you're an Ohio State fan, I don't think we can do this thing where we're like, Devin Brown blows, Keen Holtz isn't ready, Air Nolan 17, Kyle McCord wasn't good enough, and also bleep Will Howard. <laughs> like, I, I I think you have to understand that like at this point, beggars can't be choosers. And if Will Howard is the best you can get. I'll be honest with you. I, I, they competed in a pretty nice Pac-12 with him this year. I see no reason why you can't run the table next year with Will Howard as your starting quarterback, yeah. unless he's just really a product of what they do in Kansas uh, at Kansas State, which would surprise me a little bit. I think that's really well said. On you can't you know spit in the face of everybody who's an option for you. I like if we're sitting here complaining about the options we have, and I do think like Friday night. Sound the alarms. I, I like, I, how was I supposed to believe that we, they were going to go into next year and just trot out the guys they were going to have, including Aaron Nolan, and he was just going to be ready magically for to start as a true freshman. And that was going to be your competition and that was going to be your decision. I, I need it. I need to see them get somebody with some experience. And I think, I think Will Howard makes a lot of sense. Um, I, 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 I would be happier with that than I think the guys that are currently on the roster. I'm, I'm intrigued by Aaron Nolan, but I just don't think it's realistic that he plays in his, in his freshman year that all that much. Um, and to your point on like quarterback play, 
we just we just talked in the first segment about like JJ McCarthy is a fine college quarterback. Do I think he's going to be some amazing pro? No, and I think that's probably the same trajectory as like a Will Howard. I think he's a good college quarterback who can do some things that that obviously Kyle McCord couldn't. And I don't know that he's going to be an amazing pro, but if you get the right offensive line group in there around him, you have the right talent around him, you have a really good defense, which by all accounts, a lot of these guys are – that's the biggest worry for me too, Nick, is like you can't waste. The, if, the, if, the, if it's true that so many of these defensive players are coming back, you can't waste this amazing defense – on average to mediocre quarterback play next year. You just can't. And so you got to try something. And if it's Will Howard, I think this team can win the Big Ten with him under center. I think they can compete for a national championship um, with him under center. I, I'm i not trying like, – I, I think the problem fans have is you bring up being like beggars can't be choosers. I think it's the fact that it seems like Ohio State has to be a beggar. Like they should just already kind of have this stockpiled. Their plan was to have it stockpiled. They, w- they would have been having Quinn Ewers play right now. And that didn't turn out or that didn't happen. Um, but like now this is the situation you're in. If if Will Howard is the the option, I'm willing to see it through because at least I can recognize that they're trying to fill that void, trying to get somebody in there with experience. And you're a, to me, he's at least as somewhat of an upgrade from Kyle McCord where I feel good about the direction they can go if there's some other moves that are to be made because I still think the offensive line could be an issue as well. Did I hear that you are – Willing to give Will Howard uh, a chance? Willing? Let's get to the uh, Michigan panic meter. That was not great. <laughs> um, as we do every single show, we look at how we feel, how our feelings are about the uh, status of things between Ohio State and Michigan. I remained unchanged in my Michigan panic meter. Um, I actually think Michigan going to the national title game and even winning the national title is a good look for Ohio State because it shows how close you were to beating them uh, in Ann Arbor, no less this week, uh, this, or sorry, this year with, uh, with Kyle McCord as your quarterback. So in the end, Spencer, I actually think it's kind of, I don't want to say a positive, but like my panic is not heightened by Michigan uh, winning over Alabama, nor is it it heightened or lessened by the potential addition of Will Howard. Although I reserve the right to change my opinion when Will Howard officially commits to Ohio State. So what? Your is this is this good? Is this right for you? Right there, right oh, in the white. So good, right in the white. Ooh. What what <laughs> what what say you, Spencer? Ironically, the same color as uh, Will Howard, right in the white. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep mine where it was at on Friday night, which biggest shift I think we've ever had in the in the Michigan panic meter. I went from light gray to light scarlet. And I'm oh, staying wow. in the light scarlet um, after watching Michigan go to the national championship game. Still no answers on the quarterback position yet, although it seems like there's some something's afoot. When, when the Instagram never lies, Nick. Instagram just it, you, the gram never lies. You always and most, know. And most of the time for the worse. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Stay when, out when, of those DMs, boys. <laughs> if you got one of these on, stay out. It's not exactly. that hard. Exactly. Um, yeah, like. It never lies. So if if he's following people, I think it's a good sign that he's potentially coming. So if Will Howard, I, I want to get this on record. If Will Howard commits to Ohio State, are you going to flip back to at least white? In yes, the Michigan yes. Panic I, okay. I would go back to white if he if he if he does arrive in Columbus. Pending, like if we get that news this week, maybe in the set the, the show later this week, I'll be back in in the white, and then. Next week, if Michigan wins the championship, I might be back in the lights, Carl. We'll see. Who knows? So, getting to the bowl game complaints that everybody has every single year, you and I have talked about bowl fixes. And as I see it, the bowls have a few big issues. One, they happen after the transfer portal, which means yeah. rosters look dramatically different. But also, you've got guys looking ahead to the NFL. You've got guys looking ahead to – just as a kernel of doubt on whether they should play or whether, you know, whether they have something in their better interests. So to me, that is a timing issue, both of when the bowls are played and when the portal happens. Two, I think you have a lot of bowls with very little significance. And then three, I just think in terms of finding a way to make it all mean something, I, I came up, listen, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I think the one solution I think could help is if you saw the, a group of five commit to their own playoff and snag about 16 of these bowls that then basically turned into 
the group of five championship. I, I think that's one way, but I think beyond that requires a lot of yeah. thinking and a lot of fine tuning to the actual timing of the process. And I isn't, don't, I don't think the NCAA is going to do that or call. Isn't that part of what the NCAA Charlie Baker talked about um, with like trying to make the, the, the power five programs, almost their own thing. And then the group of five, their own thing. Yeah. So maybe there's something along those lines that they'd look into. I don't know. Um, I think you're I think you're spot on with with the the transfer portal opening after the regular season ends like that just needs to go away. Uh, you, you can't have that happen and expect any of these bowl games to 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 come with excuse me the merits that you're expecting them to when half of a team's roster is turned over because the guys are like ah, I'm gonna go explore my options. I also think the signing day window being in December affects some things because. Guys look at that as a reason to maybe transfer. Like that that's mm-hmm. part of the thing of their decision making is well, you got this new quarterback coming in, or you got this new receiver coming in. I don't want to be part of this team anymore. So I, I think there's some tweaks there on the schedule that can be made. I also think you're right that there's too many bowl games. Part of that though is you're letting too many teams play for bowls. I'm sorry. Six wins is not worthy of a bowl game to me. I think it needs to be bumped up to like eight. If you win eight games, I think that's a very respectable season. Yeah, you earn a little extra game, um, but but for the for like you're you're basically you're talking about these games late in the season where it's it's two mediocre teams playing against each other, and it's like oh boy, they're both at five wins. This is the one that seals their fate of if they're going to go to a bowl game or not. It's like guys, come on, like it's it's no, okay. I, the I, only I'm thing not- I would say, the only thing I would say to that is, I think the bigger issue is you don't have premier players playing in these games. And I, I think I, I think if you you know if if uh, if Central Florida is a six win team and has one good player and that guy isn't in the game, that dramatically impacts the watchability of that game. And I so I think like I think I, I, well, I me, can't uh, believe can no. I, can I throw this idea at you because I've heard now multiple people bring this up. Yeah. Um, I think Danny Cannell is one of them. Moving outside of the college football playoff games next year, moving bowl season basically to week zero. So if you so that way it's like if your team makes a bowl game, you, those players don't get to play in it. But listen, those players aren't playing in the game anyway. So what does it matter? Yeah. And then the next crop of players, they get to sort of reap the benefits of what that previous team earned, and they get an exclusive bowl game week zero that would allow them to be a, get a little extra exposure to start the season. I mean, I, I I think it would be weird to base the next season on what happened last season. I agree. I th- I don't I don't know why haven't any of these brilliant NIO collectives, as part of their their package to the players, say, all right, you're going to get seventy percent of your NIL during the season, but the final thirty percent only happens if you play in a bowl game. Like I. I mean, I think that's an obvious place. If you know, we talk about uh, playing these players all the time. I think structuring it in a way that these players actually get paid. And listen, to some players, like okay, the difference between NIL and um, going to the NFL draft isn't going to be worth it. But to dudes in the portal, yeah, yeah, it might make a difference. To guys, I mean, honestly, even a guy like Travion Henderson supposed to still be considering going into the draft. Him playing, if that had earned him, and let's say he was a uh, $500,000 player, if that had earned him, math is so hard, $15,000, I would imagine, I think my math is whole, totally horseshit on that, by the way, but if that had, you know, an extra $30,000, an extra, or actually in that case, it would have been $150,000, there goes the math. But yeah, I think if you make it, if you structure it in a way where it financially makes sense, the players have to play in that game. That's another way. And that, by the way, you're not paying them to play in the bowl game. You're you're kind of delaying that last bonus if they actually play. And then worst case scenario, they opt out or they go to the NFL, and then yeah. you don't actually spend that money. I think it's a good a good thought process. I, I think ultimately the biggest thing that, that this conversation merits, as all these conversations do, and, and I want to be clear, I think what Kirby Smart said was really profound um, after the game the other day. I, I think you've, you've heard some other – People and coaches make some comments on things. You know, I think Steve Sarkeesian talking about Malik Murphy transferring out and how he how he felt about that was also a very profound sort of moment. Like you can tell that these guys understand there needs to be some changes and they want to see some things done differently. So I think the biggest sort of summation of all this is, yes, something needs to change 
in the way that this season is handled because it's your product is watered down. The games don't matter as much. And frankly, it's, 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 it's almost unwatchable. Some of the stuff that we've seen this, this bowl season, because the, the teams are just unrecognizable. So any way they can fix that, I think is, is worth exploring. Um, I'm, I'm open to all options, but there's certain ones I'm sure that'll rise to the top that I think are better than others. All right, guys, make sure to follow the Sons of the Shoe podcast wherever you get your podcast. We rely on your support. So if you don't support us, you basically are telling us to go F ourselves. You can follow us <laughs> wherever you get your podcast. That includes uh, Apple, Spotify, the free Odyssey app. Of course, please make sure to subscribe to the 92.3 The Fan YouTube channel as well. Uh, as that helps us, that helps the entire station. We have a lot to – I know we're heading into the offseason here, but we do still have a lot to get to. At some point this week, we're expecting, I don't know, some sort of billowing smoke out of the uh, out of the furnace in Columbus to see if they're going to make any staff moves. I also think we're probably going to have to do a year in review at some point over the next week or so, Spence, just to kind of look back at what happened and, and who succeeded, who didn't succeed. You know, we'll, we'll get into more of that later on the week. So, again, follow the podcast, Sons of the Shoe, wherever you get your podcasts. And more importantly, Spencer, go Bucks.